Hello, and welcome to the Pragmatic Product Chat series, where we tackle the biggest challenges facing today's product management, product marketing, and other market and data-driven professionals with some of the best minds in the industry. I am Rebecca Caligaris, Vice President of Marketing and Product Strategy at Pragmatic Institute, and your host for this episode. Today, we're joined by Terry Sadowski, who, after over two decades as a client, active user, and advocate of Pragmatic Institute, has joined our team of premier instructors. Welcome, Terry. Thank you, Rebecca. This is Terry's debut podcast with us. We're super excited to have you on. Thank you so much. Excited to be here. Yeah. So we recently did added some new items to our launch class, as we often do, listening to the market, adding new pieces and new things. And I think one of the things as a product marketer myself, and one of the stories I think is always really interesting is to hear people's launch stories, right? We all have launch stories, the good, the bad, and bad and the ugly. And I think there's things we can learn for them all. And so Terry has nicely brought us a story of one of the launches he did for us to talk about, kind of see what we can learn from his journey. So, all right, Terry, help us set the stage. Talk to us about, about the launch. So this was a really exciting opportunity. I had been consulting for a while and had joined a client. A client invited me to join the company as their chief marketing officer. And it was in a new industry for me that I had I had really minimal experience in. So I was really excited about it. And the industry was really in the, the mortgage business and the, the financing business and specifically around how mortgagers manage the properties that they have under loan and in a lot of cases that they've had to repossess. And if you recall the mortgage crisis of the late uh, 2000s, that was when I was joining this industry. So it's really fast paced. It was, growth was massive. Unfortunately for our economy, foreclosures were going through the roof, but it was driving a lot of growth in this space. And what I had discovered was it was fairly a tired, uh, stagnant uh, part of the of the bank financing industry. Because if you think about it, over the long haul, foreclosures have not, it's not really been a big part of that space. People take out mortgages, they generally repay. There's some minor or small percentage over time that historically foreclosed. It's like one or two percent, like not a lot of activity here. And there wasn't a lot of investment in, in this space from a technology standpoint either. And then in the mid to late 2000s, foreclosures, as, as you may call, just exploded. And it put intense pressure on this industry that was really just unprepared for that. So I jumped into this space. It was really exciting. And we're trying to drive innovation into this space as a provider. And it was tough to do. Now, during this period of time, our company was acquired by a bigger company and I stayed through the transition. I liked what the bigger company was offering and, and I had a pretty good role. So I, I stuck it out and but wanted to make a good mark. Now, also just to put a little bit more context on this, I had probably 10 years of pragmatic experience at this point in time, I had been a big advocate, had leveraged it into different roles and had brought it into many clients. So I wouldn't necessarily say I was an expert at it, but I was completely bought into it. And what I wanted to tell a story of here was how we, you know, we talk about the need to talk to the quiet 80 and how, how it's uh, problematic to listen to just the noisy 20, although so many companies fall for that. So what's interesting, I think, about this is I was a complete advocate of pragmatic, and not only did I ignore the quiet 80, but I really was taking my marching marching orders from what I might call the thunderous 1%. So totally bought into one individual's thoughts on a new product to introduce. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. Should I just keep going or? Well, I mean, I think the one thing I would say, so I, I think one of the reasons this is such a great story to share too, is, is you're, you're at a company and you had an unusual change in the market that added pressure, right? So like you said, mortgages around for a long time, foreclosures was sort of the, the small write-off, right? And right. I think for a lot of us, we went through a similar thing with COVID, right? Where the, the, it added such a, a change in the market, added intense pressure to create something new uh, in a space that maybe was, was a, a departure where you go. And I think sometimes in that pressure, 
we forget all the things we know, right? We forget the disciplines that we use every day because there feels sometimes it's real pressure, but sometimes it's just amplified internally ourselves Mm -hmm. that makes us feel like, oh, you know what? We got to move fast and this one smells good. I'm going to go that way, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. And then kind of added to that, you know, just the human reality of me being a new executive at mm. this larger company that was acquired. I wanted to, I wanted to make my mark. I wanted to, I wanted to make an impression. But um, I think again, something a lot of our product managers can relate to, right? We know yeah. the discipline and we want to do that, but we also are when we anytime we join a new organization, we're looking to show have things people can see right? To have both the impact, but also things that are very visible and that research can feel less visible. And again, it adds an extra pressure. So now you've got external market pressure and internal pressure to sort of sort of have an impact and make a mark that are both cautionary tales <laughs> right. uh, in following our processes. Tale. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and it's just a reminder that we're all human too. It's not, we're not yeah. robots where we can just plug into this. So we're, 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 we, we fall, uh, Pray to our own emotions and, and motivations. So anyway, just to put a little bit more backdrop to this, my boss, the CEO and founder of the company that was acquired was pretty well known in the industry. And he absolutely revered a, an executive on the client side who was really a, an icon in the space. And he fit the mold. Like if I if there was an archetype from popular culture, he was Logan Roy from Succession, or like a, a Ned Stark from Games of Thrones. I mean, he was bigger than life. And it's two very really, different personalities there, <laughs> and, and also pretty pretty intimidating as mm. well. You know, he's just a very large guy, and uh, maybe I may I may have said the wrong name from Game of Thrones, but. Uh, I'm thinking of like the the um, the king of yep. one of the families. There, anyway, my boss got me a meeting with this gentleman who I had only had some passing conversation with. But anyway, we we arranged to have a dinner. So we had a dinner. Uh, took him to his favorite restaurant. We had some drinks. We had some wine with dinner. Conversations really flowing, and I'm thinking this is great. You know, I've got an audience with this this icon, and he's warming up to me and. I said, look, I asked him the question. If there was a single thing that our company could do to make your life easier, what would that be? And he thought about it for a minute and he said, you know, as a lender, we do so much research on the individual borrower. We have so much information about the risk worthiness of the borrower, but we really don't have that much information about the property. We don't. We we take a risk a bit on the property and think the lender can, can handle or the borrower can just handle whatever might come up. And we have all this information. There's data all over the place around the property. It would be great if we could create something like a FICO score for houses in the same way that we have a FICO score to immediately evaluate the lender. And my mind went off to the races. It's like, wow, we have all this data. And my company had amassed all kinds of information about these properties. So we know if they've been vacant or not. We know if they're in a bad neighborhood or not. We know if there have been zoning violations. We know which direction the crime rate might be moving. We know what the trends are for the for the income. And I thought we, we should be able to do this. This is kind of also at the time when, when big data and artificial intelligence were coming in. So I was thinking, wow, we could really make a big mark and have a legitimate AI-driven, big data solution to this sleepy industry. So I'm thinking, wow, this is fantastic. So I talked to the new company that had acquired us and got them excited about it. You know, there were, they did not press me on validation because, you know, I was the so-called expert. And then I could always point to this icon of industry as like, this is what we need. So the new company with its greater resources set me up with some truly world-class experts in this space. These individuals had developed some some tools and apps and algorithms for other large financial institutions that were in practice in terms of identifying fraud and other types of risks. So they were perfect, a perfect development shop to come up with this. So we created this product and could come up with a score for any individual property 
and we had the, uh, you know, we even named it. It was called the Property Risk Indicator Scoring Model, which is an acronym for PRISM, which is a very appropriate image for this because we would shed all this light and break mm. down break down a property into all of its component risks. You know, we were also looking at other things like flood zones, fire zones, proximity to police stations, proximity to fire stations, location of fire hydrants. I mean, we really had this thing nailed down. So we didn't prototype it. We were so sure about this. We just actually completed the development of the product. How long did that take you? Oh, probably about six months. Okay. So you guys are uh, moving quickly, right? That's, pretty that's, quickly, yeah. 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 And then, but, the, but the other thing was, it's not that, wasn't that complicated to do because there wasn't any code to write per se. It was really a model. Mm. And we didn't put the model into production. We just wanted to make sure that our equations and algorithms work and, and at least produce something meaningful. And it, it seemed to. So I started to take this with sales on the road to sell. And I'm thinking, you know, what? who wouldn't want this? Because the risks associated with the bad property are terrible, are just tremendous. So if you're a lender and you do, say, 100 loans and one of these properties goes south on you, your portfolio is shot. So like one bad decision could take down 100 good ones. Mm. So it seemed very leveraged. And because of the way we built this, we didn't have to charge a lot of money for this because we had access to millions of properties. So I'm thinking if we sold this for 25 cents a property a year, we'd still be making money. Mm -hmm. Um, But we went out there with five or 10 bucks. We wanted to kind of see how the market would go. And what I didn't realize, of course, nor did the icon who guided us here, nobody would be interested in this because the way the industry is really set up and it's geared and this a bit maybe of a of an Achilles heel for this space, but at least at this time, the lenders were almost entirely reimbursed for all their expenses by the various government entities or uh, partial government entities like Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac or the VA. They had all of their expenses reimbursed and they had all of their risk guaranteed. So they had literally, they had zero incentive Mm. to spend a nickel because we were mitigating risk, but there wasn't their risk. And even if we charged them a nickel, that was a nickel that they were not going to get reimbursed. So they all pointed us back to the government institutions. You need to get approval for this from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and the VA to make sure they're going to reimburse it, which is a whole nother bureaucratic morass like that would be the equivalent of like trying to get the the price of postage changed it would just be an incredibly bureaucratic uh process which we didn't we didn't want to go down so I, we ended up and i personally sat in on probably 25 to 40 sales pitches and literally had zero interest everybody loved the idea but nobody could pull the trigger on it. We literally had zero revenue, 0.00 revenue. After about six months of selling this, we had to, we had to um, declare it a, a failure, a failure. And we were so excited about it. We actually got, I actually have my name on a, on a patent pending on this. That's how, that's how big a deal we all thought it was going to be. So I had to eat a lot of crow because I was really championing this and thinking this is going to be great. With the new company, this is going to change the industry. Look at all the risk that we can go through. We did not go into this quietly. We went into this with a lot right. of bravado. And uh, yeah, it was a pretty embarrassing failure. It was a pretty embarrassing failure. And, you know, after we shut it down, I, when I thought back on the lessons that I skipped from Pragmatic, it was so obvious. It was so obvious what we did. But I also thought, how easy was that? You know, because I'm I, here. I am like advocate, mm-hmm. relative expert on the pragmatic process, and just completely blew off like one of the most important steps. You know, Terry, that's I mean, everyone listening right now is is so feeling for you on this because we all have it. Maybe not at that scale. Maybe at that scale, right? But and this is I have a bunch of questions. Just with that one for this particular story, I'm just dying of curiosity. Were you able to pivot the model? Was the model even in free useful? Nothing. Oh. Yeah. Heartbreaking. 
No. Well, we put it, we probably could have used it for free and just given it to people, to our clients for free, but there was enough administrative overhead on our okay. part to yeah. execute it that it, we, we didn't pull the trigger with zero, with zero revenue for it. Yeah. Okay. So then let's, let's just talk about it. So you, you knew in this case, you knew when we were in the sales as sales in retrospect, were there signs along the way? Or did we just so not look for them that we didn't see them? But in, re- you know, in your many hours, and I'm sure this kept you awake, right? <laughs> were there yeah, signs in, that you thought that's where I should have, Before we spent a penny developing it, we could have taken the concept to a number of other clients and potential clients yeah. just to see how they would do. But we wanted to move really fast. We thought it was, you know, potentially, because it's not that complicated to build something mm. like this. We thought if we expose it, somebody's going to do it. So we wanted to right. keep it really quiet as well. So, so it's interesting you ask about pivoting. I mean, this this work is all done. It's sitting. So if anybody listening to this has a brainstorm, they probably could license this very inexpensively from my old company there. Um, right. <laughs> well, you know, and it's it's true though because you know you're thinking you go fast. You want to be stealth. You want to be first to market. And it sounds like again, only in retrospect, Terry, you're like ah. Oh, two phone calls to clients and this would have given you Absolutely. really good like it's not like if i had spent 6 months and i commissioned an outside firm they would have found this the reason you're really kicking yourself is it's like it's two phone calls two phone and calls and i would have right? been like least, wait a minute right the release had us pump the brakes mm-hmm. and then do a little bit more digging and then we probably would have come to the same conclusion without having spent the money to build it and without all of the kind of personal investment that I put into it, you know, the time, but also just the the credibility yep. that, that I had to take being this new executive, like, oh, we got this great thing. And then it was like, oh, that thing was, uh, let's not talk about that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I think one of the things you brought up when you characterize sort of the the person who you, who had a meal with was most sort of like that they were kind of really well known. They're revered, right? They were seen as experts in the industry, but also by your CEO. Yeah. And I think that is a that is something we can all relate to again, right? Where we've got like that someone's opinion weighs more. And again, in retrospect, and as you've gone on in your career, how would you coach someone in how to sort of successfully push back or position sort of that that sort of expertise and, and still, you know, be able to sort of counteract it. Sure. It really would have been a, a simple matter to put in further validation around this. And it wouldn't, I could have positioned it in a way not to, you know, I'm, I'm validating this icon's opinion, but just like, hey, we want to get a sense in the market how we might want to price this. I mean, I could have couched the validation in so many different ways that would not have been a, a, an offense to the icon or to my boss. And it, I just, I was all in. I was, yeah. I was early in uh, on this idea. That's uh, a great, great idea though, Terry, because I do think sometimes, you know, in this case, you're all in. And it sounded like I was listening. I was like, that's an amazing idea. But sometimes we hear him and we're like, ooh, I'm not so sure. And I think sometimes our instinct is to be like, I'm not so sure. And here is why, uh, right. which can be okay. But then you kind of get into the opinion war. Right. If you present it more as, oh, that's interesting. Let's let's lean in a little. Like mm-hmm. let's let's look at all the positives for it, and in there you find the negatives. You've not tainted your research ahead of time because that also happens to us. We're like, you didn't like the idea, and now your research says it's a bad idea. Oh, that's shocking. Right, right. <laughs> right? Yeah, but that kind of positioning it as, yeah, let's go forward. Let's check these three things as on our path, and then when that shows it, we don't have quite the same uh, the same. The other- the, the other lesson that I took from this, you know, as I debriefed this a million times in my head, was that the, the, the icon, the senior executive, the captain of this industry, he was unfamiliar with some of these processes down at that level, too. And, you know, the reimbursement concept was something he was aware of, but he had not thought that through mm. uh, in terms of how we were going to do it. And I think also... To be frank, I mean, we were talking over drinks over <laughs> dinner, and I don't think he expected me to jump all over this and actually start to execute it. I think the reaction he was looking for more was that is a brilliant idea. 
you are so brilliant. What are some other brilliant ideas? Mm. I think he was looking more. I don't think he expected me to go off and build this thing. And then once we started, you know, I would kind of check in with him a little bit. I, I recall him like kind of like being being surprised, like, wow, that's great. Now he never backed off. Like he always thought it was a good idea, but I, I uh, he definitely was not, we're not conversing in the, in the guise of product development or new product ideas, a little yeah. bit on the new product ideas, but I, don't, I really don't think he was expecting us to go build something like this so fast. So, you know, when you did realize, you know, I mean, let's be honest, 30, 40 sales calls, six months, that's a lot, right? Yeah. Yeah. Were you the one who stood up and said, hey, so this is not the path or, or you know, how would it, because it happens to all of us at some point, you have to be like, hey, this was a bad plan. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah I, I took the bullet on that and, you know, a couple of my sales folks, because I was running the sales organization too, I had the product and, and sales, a couple of my sales folks after five or six said, we're not going to be able to sell this. And I was like, oh, you don't get it. Let's talk <laughs> about how you're selling it. And then we went down that path. So I was, I was so bought in that I, I really pushed back even on some of the leading indicators. I was so sold on the idea. So I had great conviction around this, obviously, but also had like kind of, I would say minimal checks and balances on myself mm-hmm. because, you know, I had, you know, I was running sales and marketing. It was an, an, an acquisition. So the new company was kind of looking to me to make these decisions. And, you know, so obviously this first big decision out of the gate was not a good one. I was able to recover fine with that company, but I mean, this, this made it a little tougher for sure. Well, and I think that one of the ways that, again, just a good lesson for all of us is by when it doesn't work, the best thing you can do for your career is to be honest about it. Absolutely. Because, you know, too often there, and it's hard, right? I mean, to your point, you've got, you're not passionate about it because you think it's a bad idea, right? You're passionate about it because you really think it could work. And we do, especially when we're running and running hard, it's it's sometimes a, it's hard to see when their pushback is because they've got good points or they just like, oh, they're just not seeing the vision. They'll get right. there, right? Yeah. Um, and that's, that's a hard, and I think it's a good place to have a few people internally that you can feel like will, will really tell you if you asked, right. Or, or even offer it in an opinion that you, you know, it's good to have a few peers inside your organization who you can, who you believe are good truth tellers. Definitely. And, you know, to the point about, you know, calling it, you know, and I had, I called this uh, DOA basically. And, you know, I, I kind of, use that sales adage of the next best thing to a yes is a fast no. Mm -hmm. And that applies to product development too. If you get enough indicators that it's a flop, call it and, and put a kibosh to further resources and move on and move on. Cause there are a lot of good ideas out there, especially if you, again, using the pragmatic approach, if you set up that, that ongoing cycle of discovery and validation, and you're always going to have new things to, to to wrap your head around and get excited about. Unfortunately, we did in this case, but you know, even though six months maybe seems like a long time, I mean, in um, pretty good, it's pretty fast in, in a lot of ways. In the big picture, yeah, and we were able to cycle through enough sales calls that it was like, all right, we're we're done with this. So, yeah, don't hang on to a bad, uh, uh, and I don't fall in love with the project, I guess. And I talk about this in my classes. Mm-hmm. Because, um, you know, that's that tends well, and to... even, you know, you don't have to have not done the research to still not have something succeed, right? You can have done the research and there can still be reasons it doesn't work. And, and I think letting those go is, it is a tough, you know, it's fresh, just even in a minor side on our courses sometime, right? We've got too much content to fit in the day. And so we have to kill our darlings, right? Mm-hmm. You're like, mm-hmm. oh, For I, sure. yeah, For yep. sure. So after all this, we don't want anyone else. We don't want anyone to fall down this, this trap. <laughs> Learn from Terry. We don't want to do this. What are sort of some of the key advice that you would give them so that they don't fall? Well, for me, especially now as I'm teaching the framework and to think about the framework as kind of a blueprint as opposed to like a series of process steps. I mean, when you get into a situation like this and you get really excited about it and you seem like you have some validation, just kind of go back, 
you know, the lesson for me was to go back to the pragmatic approach, which I would have, I would have avoided all this because I would have done the validation and it kind of, even though I would been using and executing on pragmatic for a while, it it gave me a fresh appreciation for even the things that I maybe took for granted like that, like the quiet 80 versus the noisy 20. I said, ah, we know this. And now when I teach this, I talk about how companies get into that situation, why they only listen to the noisy 20. And I can relate to that so well because I was so guilty of it myself, even having been kind of indoctrinated in the pragmatic approach, you can forget it. You can forget it. You can get seduced by the icon of industry and get seduced by your own ideas or the opportunity. And in this case, it was kind of a perfect storm of all of them. And I, and there it, I went, hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> right? Well, and I do. I, I think we always... Yeah. I mean, again, you can see the pressures. We can all get there. We all have to make choices. And look, sometimes we make gambles and they work. And even when you know it's not the right way, it can be a tempting path to keep going down. I don't think you're alone. And I think one of the things too, just so you don't feel bad, Terry, one of the things we talk about with all of our instructors is we're looking for instructors who have implemented the pragmatic framework successfully and unsuccessfully because- Look, it's it is a blueprint. It's not a you know it it's not a, a process. It's not, and and we all have pressures in different spots. And as you said, sometimes like this is a lesson you don't have to learn twice, but when you learn it so acutely. But um, but yeah, you, we can learn a lot from those. And and certainly we definitely learn from our mistakes. I mean, there's there's a lot of truth. I mean, there's in, incredible power in in really understanding that. So for sure. Do you just for our listeners? Let's also do you have like a favorite launch success story like a, just a little you know give us the hey and there are times in my career i've done this really really well and we all have them both both sides but we'd love i'd love just to hear a little one of one that you uh um, really liked let me give that a little bit of thought here maybe one that that comes to mind quickly is a another startup story and this this led to another acquisition of our company we were acquired by a company um well, I guess I can name, we were acquired by Cisco okay. uh, prior to this experience that I just mentioned. And what makes this story memorable kind of within the, within the uh, pragmatic context is it wasn't a launch of a new product or a new service per se, as it was repositioning mm-hmm. what we provided in the market. And I do tell this story uh, on occasion in in our classes and in, in classes that I teach at least sometimes, but the decision by Cisco to acquire us, they were looking at three different companies of ours. And as the chief marketing officer of this company, I was pretty involved in the due diligence by our suitor, Cisco, and got to know the, the M&A team fairly well. And after they acquired us, I was able to ask them over drinks one night. It's like, what's the real reason why you bought us? Because these other two companies were very viable. And one of them, in fact, was probably in a better acquisition just strategically. You know, I don't know what the numbers were with the other ones. But they said that they there was really a, a couple of key reasons why they bought us. One is that everybody they talked to, executives, senior managers, and people working entry-level jobs, everybody was speaking from the same songbook singing from the same songbook in terms of what problem we were solving in the market. And that was music to my ears because we had a small marketing team, but I kind of evangelized them and had them go out and preach. This is what we're doing to everybody in the company. And we had the buy-in from my fellow executives, but, but everybody got on the same page with respect to what is our, what's the problem we're solving, what's our messaging, what's our positioning. And then the other thing they said is that you're wasn't just that you were all on the same page, but you guys were really insightful. You really had an understanding of, of not only what the problem is you're solving, but what's the world like for the people we're solving the problem for. You showed real empathy for that. And the reason why that makes a made an impression on me was this was a result of my first exposure to pragmatic. So I had been. You know, long story short, I had come from consumer products into technology. When I came into technology, I was really shocked at the lack of understanding of what product management is. After spending 10 years in consumer products where you really get some good training on that. So I started to train people on my own 
and I would I had a department of a hundred some people. I was taking them through some of the learnings that I got after ten years in consumer products, and raised the bar through that training. And was starting to do it at the startup when one of my employees said, "Hey, you should look at Pragmatic." So I did, and hired Pragmatic to come in and do training. And it was better than anything that I could do on my own, of course. And I was totally bought in. And this was my first use of Pragmatic for real and resulted in an acquisition where the M&A people pointed to the lessons from Pragmatic as a primary driver. So I was already sold. And then that just completely locked it in, completely locked it in. What I find so interesting there too is, Terry, you talked about that all sort of being the result of a rebrand as well. And I, I a repositioning, right? Repositioning. Uh, the, there was a yeah. repositioning that then kind of got all that messaging and alignment internally. And that's really impressive to me because I think it's one of the hardest, particularly a repositioning when it's not failing, right? Like if it's failing, I can get everyone <laughs> bought in repositioning. But if it's doing okay, and we're going to reposition it because it can be better. That can be really hard because there's all of this sort of inertia or, or gravitational pull mm-hmm. to keep it going in the way it is, which may not be ideal, but we know like we know what to expect and would work. And then to be able to get the entire company to pivot the way they talk about and think about there is a it is an impressive feat because it is among the more, I think, difficult pieces is that repositioning. It was challenging, full stop. The tailwind we had in this repositioning was is the positioning that we inherited was so bad. <laughs> <laughs> people people really uh, glommed on. The, the position that we had was, you know, it was very feature-driven, very technology-driven. Mm-hmm. It was, it was uh, as those written by network engineers for network engineers specifically. And, yep. and it didn't speak to the greater benefit at all of what we were providing, which was basically uptime. And we also were able to imbue our position with a lot of empathy for the people in the in the management chain for whom uptime was a key measure. Basically, we were just saying, you're, with us, your network's not going to go down. Or if it goes down, you can have a really fast recovery. And then all of the business and professional benefits associated with that, as opposed to our response time measured in you know, microseconds or, or, or something like that. So it was, I wouldn't say it was an easy transition, but it was a very comfortable transition for even the, the real tech folks in our business. It just was a much better way of talking about our solution. Great. Awesome. Well, Terry, I really appreciate you joining us today. I had an excellent time with you and I hope that you'll join us again. Thank you, Rebecca. It was a lot of fun too. All right. Thank you everyone for listening, hearing sort of the the launches that go well and go bad. We all have them. And one of the best things we can do is share our story and learn from each other. So, okay, that's it. Don't forget to join us next week when we tackle another great topic designed to help you elevate your product, your company, and your career. 